Uh, I'm Steve Reynolds. I'm the CTO here at Imagine Communications, and I'm going to be hosting a panel on the business case for the transition to IP. So let me welcome to the stage my panelists. Joining me from EVS, we have Benoit Favrier, who is the SVP and CTO. From Cisco, we have Tom Ohanian, who is the market segment strategist. You got it right. All right. Uh, from Imagine, we have Brick Exton, who is our vice president of product strategy for networking products. And also from Imagine, John Mayotte, who is our chief convergence architect. Thank you. So I invited these guys to join me for this because each and every one of them is working on this transition to IP. And you've probably seen a lot of the demos that are in the booth. You've probably heard a lot of the talk about the, the things that we're working on and the mechanisms that we're using to implement. But what I really want to focus this panel on is the why. Why are we doing this? What, what's really driving this transition? So I'm going to start by giving each one of the panelists uh, a couple of seconds to summarize for the audience, what do you think the key drivers are? Why is this transition to IP happening now? Uh, and what are the things that are really driving demand from the industry? So Benoit, you want to start? Yes, sure. So good evening, uh, everybody. I am Benoit Ferrier, the CTO of EVS. Um, for EVS, well, the main market is sport live video production. And one of the main drivers we see uh, is uh, in the OB truck, we see the 4K and the UHD as a main driver for the video over IP. What we see is customers, most of our customers have made a lot of investment in HD in the past. And now they have to do uh, investment for, H, uh, for UHD and also for video over IP. And they are wondering if they have to do the same investment for video over IP and also for 4K because video over IP opens a lot of opportunities for the video production, especially for lives. Sure. So this is one of the key drivers. The other one is uh, we are involved in many, many uh, big event production like Olympics or World Cup, and we see a lot of stadiums uh, which is equipped with uh, with, uh, with uh, IT uh, infrastructure. So also for big events, just to ensure that we have many streams produced together, we see a lot of drivers for the big events. Mm -hmm. the, the last driver we see in the EVS market is uh, in the studio production. We have a lot of customers uh, wiring uh, or uh, setting up new installation in their facility, and they are wondering if they have to do SDI or IP or both. Mm -hmm. So in our case, the hybrid and the, the, the mix between SDI and IP is really important also. Tom, what do you think? What would you add to that? Well, I think, you know, we all hear in the industry about flexibility and agility and all the, what Steve likes to say, the ITY words. You know, in my opinion, it's the consumer. Consumer is driving behavior, and all of the industries, whether you're a content provider, whether you're a service provider, you need to be able to service that, that consumer. And so th I think there, there are two things we look at. We look at the aggregation piece, mm -hmm. things you've been, been, been was talking about, the, the distribution piece. That, so uh, from a contrib contribution distribution piece, it's IP. We have, most of the customers are there. So, you know, it's aggregated. You know, as IP, it lands somewhere, lands in that production facility, an OB truck somewhere, and things have to happen to it, right? And so, how do you repurpose infrastructure the, the best possible way? And you do that within software. And so, I think there, there are really two components here. It's, it's not only the professional media networking piece, the SDI to IP transition, but it's also the fact that, you know, dedicated appliances, server sprawl, are all going into you know software instances, VM instances, and, and those types of things. And last last piece I think is it's growth, right? So we have a customer who has a seven-year-old facility. They will run out of power and space in two years because every closet, every space has you know, servers in it that are not connected to anything else, doing purpose-built things. And so because you can move software profiles around, you really do have a very very um, you have an environment that can scale up or scale down. Mm -hmm. Rick, what do you think? 
Uh, just reflecting on what Benoit was saying and what Tom was saying, the, uh, there's a, an opportunity to move to IP that I think is undeniable. It's about aligning the, uh, it's about the alignment of uh, broadcast technology with the technology curve that's available in Moore's Law. It's about writing the coattails of the rest of the enterprise uh, infrastructure community and the things that they're doing. We're seeing the alignment of port speeds in the enterprise space with, a, with the speeds and feeds required inside of the, the broadcast space, the, the alignment of compute horsepower with our need to move to a more flexible architecture and mm -hmm. software. And we're seeing an alignment at the business level with the agility that we need to address new markets. And the only way we're going to ever get to that agility, speaking to you know, um, servicing the consumer, is to move to an IP slash IT and COTS infrastructure. Mm -hmm. John, I know that you, yep. uh, you've been spending a lot of time working on this one, so what, what would you share with the audience in terms of drivers that you're seeing? The, the two drivers I see are really around scalability, so the ability to design a facility that can grow and can morph and can also be flexible to change to different production requirements as time goes by. You know, years ago, you'd build an SDI facility with a plan of it's going to do these things and only these things, and it's going to do them for seven years or nine years. And I think all of us can agree that whatever we're going to be doing two or three years from now, it isn't exactly what we thought it would be. Mm -hmm. so, so when we talk about those ITY words, uh, I think what I heard was we, we need flexibility, we need scalability, we need agility. Um, but Tom, you actually mentioned something that, that I think is really interesting about where we are in terms of the current state, and it's how people are actually using the data center hardware in order to, to facilitate this change. Where do you see things at? Where are we right now in terms of the ability to do this? So I think it's what's, what's really fun about this is that we can take a page out of the book of you know, large web service providers, you know, large companies who have, uh, you know, north of $200 billion in their war chest, right? And if you look at web-based companies, they've already made these transitions, right? They're already working on, you know, compute off the shelf, um, uh, hardware. They're already embracing OpenStack and other, you know, applications such as that, right? And so why? Because they have scalability, right? They have on-prem scalability, they have cloud scalability, they have hybrid scalability, they have these things. Um, so. If you look at that transition, you can see, okay, purpose-built workstations moved to servers, collapsed into appliances, then went into scalable shared computing layers, and then went to hybrid, and then went to cloud, right? So salesforce.com, cloud-based SaaS, right? We're in that trajectory, and you know, the majority of my customers right now that I see in the broadcast media entertainment space, they're making that transition from appliances to the computing layer. And that in turn is making all the manufacturers in this environment, or there are 1,500 manufacturers that service our industry, right? 85% of those manufacturers have three products or less. It's very, very fragmented. And therefore, they are slowly and sometimes, you know, in an interesting way from a revenue perspective, having to go and embrace this new reality of it's not a appliance, it's not a purpose-built uh, system, it's something that actually has to work on a, on, a, on, a on, a, on a computing layer. So I think the great news about this is that this is a path that's well understood. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that you know, we should all embrace. So it's a path that's well understood, but, but is it a path that we're really moving down today? Well, John, what do you think? Where do you think we're at with this? Well, I think we're definitely at, at the beginning cusp of a phase. But this transition from, you know, of the workspace has been going on a couple of years. So moving from SDI to IP is sort of the second step of a three-part thing that's going on in the industry. You know, for the last 10 years, we've been migrating from hardware-based appliances to software-based appliances. Sure. So as you talked about the you know, rack of disparate servers, well, they're all doing something. And it's something that 10 years ago was probably a box of hardware that did that. So now that we've moved into everything being software, the next step is to free ourselves at the interface level, mm -hmm. away from bespoke interfaces of the television industry like SDI into the lingua franca, into IP. 
And then the third step, I'm sure Brick will talk about in a minute, is the software-defined workflows and how we get to true flexibility. Well, so Brick, let's throw it over to that. What, what do you, I know this is one of the, the more interesting challenges that we've had to, to face, you know, as we go through this transition. Um, what do you really think we need to do in order to move to that kind of a fully software-defined network and move to a fully software-defined workflow to make this IP environment work? Uh, two things. One is that while we have a, an ongoing trajectory and a history in the enterprise market of, of how to accomplish these things, how to do them at scale, how to do them with high availability, um, they're not specific to the broadcast domain. And so what we've had to go do is, is take the technologies that have been created by the, you know, these Fortune 10 companies and bring them back into our space and, and sanitize them for the way that broadcasters need to do them. And then the second major thing we've had to do is become our own supply chain of technology that we can utilize to fulfill the requirements of, these, uh, of this new paradigm, mm -hmm. the, the, this thought process that we can look at a, at a broadcast supply chain and we can describe it completely in software. We can describe it uh, completely you know, agnostic of the underlying IT in a way that allows us to move it into the cloud into the future sure. and, and, and do it in a way that is, is still familiar to the existing operations uh, in the facility. And that certainly has to be one of the biggest challenges, right? Making it look like what the operations and the production people know and love um, and, and trying to map that forward. So, Benoit, I know that you guys are working on some things uh, in, in the transition to IP that kind of fall into that category. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, at TVS, we have a new, a new initiative called IP for Life because we also we think that the initiative of IP and the implementation will be iterative. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we cannot imagine having our customers dropping all, all their stuff to, to move to IP and to, uh, to, uh, to invest in brand new equipment. So again, the transition will be really important. So that's why we, we try to remain open at TVS and we have many initiatives to make workflow working all together. So we have a joint uh, demonstration with Imagine Communication just to ensure that with the current uh, CMT 2022, we have interoperability, for instance. Also, the ability to, uh, to, to mix different stream into mm -hmm. an IP uh, wire is really important for many customers. So we have also set up a demonstration with Cisco where we we have the ability to, to mix signal of video switching using IP, but also signal coming from the camcorders and also uh, FTP transaction. And we, uh, we, uh, we have a live demonstration with no latency that proves that uh, the IP implementation is okay. So we try to be pragmatic and to, to, to ensure that the, the current implementation mm -hmm. is working fine and can be mixed to, to do an hybrid uh, implementation for existing customers. So you actually mentioned a word there that uh, we get a lot of questions about when we talk about the transition to IP, and that word is latency. Yeah. What, what can you tell the audience about where we're at in terms of coming close to what looks like a broadcast-grade uh, latency for production? Yeah, so if you, if you look at IP, the, the latency is very low. Mm -hmm. But again, the, the bandwidth uh, reservation is really important using SDN, for instance. So that's why we try to implement... SDN bandwidth uh, reservation just to ensure that if you mix uh, asynchronous and synchronous uh, signal mm -hmm. over an, uh, an IP uh, signal, we ensure that we have the real time and the lowest latency in the live production, for instance. So it sounds like you're there. It sounds like you've already absolutely, have... Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah? Uh, we, uh, we are working a lot in the R&D and uh, in the uh, innovation team in our labs just to ensure that we... We, we, we test everything and we have all the technical building block just to be uh, time to market when the market will be ready to really move forward with the driver I mentioned previously. You know, I, think, I think, Steve, you know, one, of the, one of the issues with that is, <clears throat> you know, as, you, as you look at this SDI to IP transition in terms of you know, professional media networking, th there are a few things that you really have to ensure to the user that they will continue to have. Now, we've had broadcast SDI infrastructures for many decades. They're predictable. They're well known. We know, what, we know what's going to happen. It's not like someone's going to plug a laptop into an SDI connection, right? And yet, we open our world into a lot of things that can happen. So you need the predictability. You need the deterministic networking. You need the cost. Um, what you don't need is you don't need any additional cost because you're adding some video-oriented feature onto what should be, you know, just a, uh, you know, a switch that you can repurpose for anybody else in the environment. And so 
It's those types of things, latency control, cost control, deterministic networking, security. Um, you know, so w one of the things you know, that we're doing at the show is we're working on demonstrations. We have demonstrations. You'll see 40 gig connections between our booth and EVS's booth. You'll see um, uh, a Versio playout instantiated as you know, a virtual machine and a, pro and a broadcast pop-up channel from nothing. You know, um, and, and creating all the VLANs, creating all the, the compute cores, and, and then loading the applications and playing things out. Um, but to have that discussion with someone, you have to say to them, here's that 40 gig connection. And we're going to, just for the sake of purposes, we'll put an FTP uh, transfer on it, consuming everything, right? Um, or a UDP you know, transfer, consuming everything. But live video has to take precedence. And there have to be policies and controls that now ratchet down that file transfer so that video always has, you know, that right of passage, right of way. And so, mm -hmm. but it's those types of things I think that are the biggest concerns that the industry has had and the people who have said, well, it's not going to happen. You, how, how possibly can you build all of these things that we've had in? And well, it's here and it's here now. And there's really no, no reason to delay. Uh, I hear what you're saying. And I, I think technically a lot of what we need to talk about is possible. It's things that people have, have figured out how to solve. But I think one of the areas where we haven't done enough work is actually in standardization. Um, there's, there's a lot of work that's been done kind of as point-to-point -point integration. But John, I'm going to go to you first on this one. What do you think are some of the areas that we still need to continue to work on with regards to standardization to make sure that we've got the interoperability to make all of this fly? Oh, well, standards is is sort of the core of the industry, right? The, the benefit of SDI is that I can plug my SDI into a Sony thing or a Panasonic thing or whatever, and it works. And it wasn't always that way. The early days of SDI were a little rough, but it was a long time ago, so people have forgotten. Um, at this point, for the data formats, the actual handoff between equipment of the content itself, mm -hmm. the SMPTE 2022, for example, has worked really well. So. For integrating with EBS, you know, they, they came to our lab one day in Munich and we plugged some things together and it worked. You know, and we, we all acted surprised, but we weren't very surprised. It worked <laughs> yeah. quite well. Mm. Um, we've done interop testing with, you know, Nevion and Grass and all manner of other customer companies and competitors. And at a, you know, at an engineering level, as a group of, you know, sometime competitors, sometimes partners, we all get that the industry expects us to interoperate at the signal level. The next territory of challenge really is at the control and management levels and reaching out in the ability to manage each other's equipment to make complex workflows happen cleanly. And that's the state of standardization now. And there's a lot of committees working on it. I'm on some, other people are on some, and we, we're working together to make it happen. So Ben, why I know you're involved in some of that too. Absolutely, yes. So I agree. Uh, um, we uh, CMT 2022 is working well, and we 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 have a live demonstration working right now. The, one of the main question mark we 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 are still having is uh, on the compression scheme for UHD and 4K. So that's why EVS try to remain open right now. Mm -hmm. And of course, we don't want to be uh, stuck or closed into a one compression scheme. We want to be open. And we are living exactly the same path we, we, we lived with uh, HD, with a lot of vendors trying to, to, to maybe to, to frame the market with one codec. But we think with video over IP, there will be many codecs. That's why it's not uh, yet decided. There are many options on the table. Mm -hmm. There are some going to CMT, some other more proprietary. And EVS' uh, goal is to support everything. And uh, I think there are still question mark on the, on the video codec scheme, especially for 4K. But I think it's clear that, that it's another one of those ITY words, interoperability. If we don't have interoperability between all of the different players in this, uh, the I IP ecosystem just doesn't flourish. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I want to I wanna move on to one final question here. Um, and it's the one that I, I think we kind of advertised as the tagline on this panel, which is the, uh, the cost of all of this. Um, so Brick, you spend a lot of time looking at you know, kind of the business model behind this infrastructure transition. What, what can you say about where we are in terms of the cost of the transition to IP? Uh, I think it's still unfolding a little bit, mm -hmm. but I think what we've discovered, we went into this uh, a few months ago or a year ago thinking that, you know, that, that the transition to IP was going to come at a cost, and that cost was going to be you know, double-digit percentage points over uh, a pure 
SDI infrastructure. But what we simultaneously saw while we're making this transition was two things. One is that uh, there's a general collapse of the technology that's being deployed. We're not deploying as many boxes because the, the technology can, can be captured in software and those software functionality can be collapsed together into fewer servers. Mm -hmm. And so we, we were actually seeing less ports being utilized to perform the same function. Uh, so that's, that's one layer. As, the, as, as Moore's Law kicks in and switch capacity goes up and port price drops down, there's another economic that jumps in which says that we'll get more out of each port without doing anything, you know, by just simply defining the way that we're using those ports. Mm -hmm. But there's a, a yet another driver that's happening, which I think is the most important driver in all of this, which is that uh, the move to IP and the move to COTS and the move to virtualization creates new business opportunities. Yes. And these are opportunities that did not exist in an SDI domain, the ability to pop up a channel on mm -hmm. demand and to run that channel for a couple of hours because that's what makes sense to do. The ability to, um, to add a new service onto the end of your network. We've, we've gone from this world where uh, technology was tacked on to the end of your infrastructure to a world where your business drivers are now defining the way that you use your infrastructure. And so you're designing, um, virtually designing your business requirements in a, in a software environment, overlaying that onto the network, and then spinning up that service. And you're doing it in minutes. And you just can't compare the economics of that kind of agility and flexibility with what existed before in the SDI domain. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. So you're saying that it's actually the, the economic upside, it's the, the ability to generate new revenue that more than offsets the cost of doing things with IP. Yeah, I, I, think, I, think the move to IP, I think the move to IP and COTS is going to be its own driver, and I think at the end result of that we're going to find out is that it's more efficient to run in an IP environment. Everything from how you plan your infrastructure to how you wire it, how do you utilize those wires, that's all going to work out to be more efficient. But the business driver that's going to allow you new business flexibility is actually going to create a new revenue opportunity, mm -hmm. or multiple revenue opportunities, and that changes the equation in a more fundamental way. Mm -hmm. So, Tom, your, your business is all around the, the, the equipment and the services and, and the connectivity to do that. How, uh, how do you see that? How does Cisco see that? So on the one hand, Steve, right, you could say, well, we're actually in the creative destruction aspect of the business in the sense that port costs go down. We sell less ports. We used to make a lot of money selling ports. Sure. But the genie's out of the bottle, right? And so it becomes really how do you constructively put things back together? Mm -hmm. And I think it's, 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 you know, media, broadcast media entertainment is really, uh, you know, a great use case for converged infrastructures. And you hear it all the time, right? Converged infrastructures, we have to get into that world. But compute, network, storage, that really can be carved up into resource pools that guarantee you a certain amount of compute cores, a certain amount of network sustained throughput, a certain amount of storage I.O. defined as a policy which respects what the business, what that workflow has to be for the business that it's servicing, that's what you get with IP, and that's those are those are three important constructs for, from an infrastructure perspective, you know that 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 we that we offer into the marketplace, um, and I you know one of the other aspects is, you know, and Brick touched upon this. If you think about it, you know, one of the things that Les Moonves said at the at the upfronts uh, in, in this year was 40% of his revenue is coming from sources that didn't didn't even exist five years ago, hmm. and so you know. Uh, what are those things, right? And what kind of what kind of uh, emphasis is that put on the technical teams to actually deliver infrastructure, you know, as a service to to new business models that they didn't predict and didn't plan for, you know, and other things aren't always equal, right? So, 12 gigabit per second, you know, requirements in today's infrastructure, it's not there. Things aren't equal, right? Mm -hmm. They are changing, mm -hmm. so you'll get there faster and you'll get there more efficiently. Um, you know, through this. I mean, our, our stance is really, um, you know, application-centric infrastructures tied together are lots of the pieces of the, of the puzzle that we, that we have, but it all has to operate with, with other applications. You know, that's why, we, you know, we depend upon, imagine, an EVS in terms of that application level of support. So, the, and then the last thing is, so you think, well, you know, people say pop-up channel, and now it's the kind of this buzzword. Why would I ever, why would I ever want to do this? Well, if you're a movie studio and you actually have television stations and you want to put up a channel that's dedicated to, let's just say as an example, you know, 
a Star Wars release for four weeks and have intense materials available 24-7, you're not going to wait two months to go and provision and do all that stuff. And that's what really the business requires. You do that in an IP world. You're echoing a little bit of what Brick said about the, the, the opportunity, but I kind of also hear you saying that you can't really make an apples to apples comparison. I, am I hearing that right? Or do you think that it's possible? No, I don't think you can make an apples to apples comparison because what you can do on a, let's say a, a, a 20 core server, you know, under virtualization um, is very different than, you know, having a stack mm -hmm. of appliances. It's very different. You know, 100 pizza boxes doing playout channels, it just doesn't equate to this world. You can, you know, the whole point is, can you create and repurpose logical resource pools on the fly. And if you can do that, you know, then it's really, it, there, there's, no, there's no apples to apples comparison. Okay. Well, I, I think the other part of that is, is once you've, once you've defined those, the, how you're going to utilize those pools of resources, you have a software abstraction that tells you how to use those resources and the applications that you're going to deploy on them. And you can pick those up, pack them up in an email, and, you know, and send them to somebody else. I mean, the, the fact that you can replicate your entire environment because you now have it all captured mm -hmm. as a software-defined workflow is, is just an amazing potential for and And these, the are X, these are XML templates, right? I mean, these are, you can read what these policies are, clone them, and you get a cloned environment, you know, instantly. Like that, yeah. John, you're working a lot closer to kind of the physical layer on a lot of these things. How do you see the cost comparison between yeah. IP and, and baseband? You know, when you're... You know, when I started working on all this uh, a couple of years ago, it was, you know, you could just barely buy switches with 10 gig ports. And then they became, you know, a standard switch had 48 10 gig ports. And then now the table stakes is sort of a 1RU switch with like 32, 36, 40 gig ports. Mm -hmm. And that's like every 18 months, you know, hmm. miraculously, yeah. all these years later. I mean, Gordon Moore made his prediction in 1971. And it's still true in 2015. There's not many things that anybody thought were true then that are actually still true now. <laughs> and it's really hard to imagine what the next factor of two is, that 18 months from now we'll be talking about, you know, 100 gig ports like they're a bread and butter thing. It's a very different infrastructure. And the same thing's true of the cores. You know, dual six cores was a huge thing two, three years ago. Now we talk about dual 12 cores. Now we talk about, you know, two years from now, uh. these, each server blade having, you know, 36, 40 cores on it. It's just hard to imagine that that continuing factor of two cadence, it's going to enable a lot of things that we can't even conceive of today or conceive of being economical will suddenly make the economic case. So things like these, you know, specialty channels, part of it is the difficulty of, you know, putting them up and part of them is the whole infrastructure of delivering to the consumer didn't used to exist. And now most consumers can be reached with a real IP network all the way to their home. So we can deliver pop-up channels in a way that we didn't use to deliver them. It sounds like you're saying I should add inevitability to my, uh, my list of words, huh? Well, I think thinking, thinking a little differently helps a lot, right? Because, I mean, we've all been accustomed to, I remember, you know, I was a post-production editor in Boston. I cut about 700 commercials in a three and a half year period. We were like the first place that had a seat of alias. And it was 40 grand for that software application, right? And, and, and then you start to go into the lineage of, you know, GPU accelerated add-in cards. Mm. We, it's th we have to think differently about this. You're going to have GPU on die available on blade servers that you can just, you know, max out into 160 core um, you know, computing layer. That's a, just a very different mindset. You can do very unique things once you have that kind of scalability and, and those kind of developments. And that's, that's very soon. So Benoit, well, I'm going to give you the last, the last word on the economic discussion here. Um, in the work that you've been doing, how do you see IP as being comparable to uh, the way we used to do things? It's really hard to, to compare, but I think in terms of um, number of channels, when you do production, for instance, when you take an EVS uh, server right now, you have 12 channels. And if you want to use only two channels, you, you need to use two channels out of 12, okay? Using the uh, IP world and the scalability, you will be able maybe to, to stack many servers together and use only allocated resources for a small production. 
and then scale to bigger production using the ability of IP. Mm -hmm. We have this new, at TVS, we have this new uh, cutting edge switcher called DV, enabling to switch the video using IP, uh, IP uh, tra um, transaction. And then uh, you can, we are working on the new workflow uh, enabling to do distributed production. So you can distribute your resources over different locations. And if you need to use two channels, you use only the two resources of channels, and if you need to do many more for a big event, for instance, you have the ability just to use many more, mm -hmm. thanks to the IP production. Nice. So we, we see a benefit in, in terms of uh, cost effectiveness in, uh, in that case. And, and taking advantage of all the flexibility of the, the IP platform. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Well, we have a, a minute for a couple of questions here. Um, Pam, I think you've got Mr. Microphone. So is there anybody that wanted to, to volunteer a question? You guys must have done a fantastic job of answering all <laughs> questions. Um, okay, well, if no one has a question, I'm going to wrap up and I'm going to ask one question uh, of each of the members on the panel in summary. And um, we've got a lot of people in the audience here today who are starting to think about their IP transition. So from each one of you, I'd like to, I'd like to hear the answer to the question, what is the one thing that they should be thinking about? What is the, 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 the one piece of advice that you would give them based on the work that you've done over the course of the last year or so um, that they think about as they, they move towards this transition? Uh, John, I'm going to start down at your end. I guess uh, to me, the, the core planning assumption you have to think through is the kind of redundancy and reliability architecture. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you really protect signals? How do you have two paths, two copies, full redundancy and reliability through the architecture? Brick? Um, I'm going to answer with the, with the, with the, the non-technical question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think the, 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 the biggest challenge that we have as we think about how we're going to move to IP is really to think about how we're going to change our thought processes. It, it can be everything from how you plan your network to how you, you staff your operations. There's a lot of consideration that has to go into education and, and you know, uh, thinking about the changes that are coming and the, and the dynamics that it's going to provide your business and the way you're going to be able to uh, launch new services on demand. And, and I think that those kinds of things are going to end up driving the way you're, you run your business in the future. And so those are, those are the kind of the background tasks as the technical folks mm -hmm. start to consider how they're going to do network planning and, and you know, server utilization and, and all of those things. And that's an interesting notion. You're, gonna, you're going to do differently, therefore you must think differently. Yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, Tom, you've already shared a lot of good wisdom with us today, but, but what's the summary? What's the one thing that you think people should keep top of mind? The, the thing that always comes back when we talk to people about technology is we can, get, we can get through those hurdles. Uh, where the stumbling block is, and Brick touched upon this, is the training and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the components of the staff. And so there is a magical mix, and when you get a person who really understands the broadcast workflows and is IP knowledgeable and savvy, and that's a very special person. We're seeing more of those people, and we're seeing some of the mentorship on the broadcast side, coming into the IP side and vice versa. I don't, I don't think it's one versus the other. Uh, I think you have to develop those people and you've got, you got to train them. Um, because increasingly, it's, it's going to be about you know, how, to, how to not lose you know, uh, broadcast-centric workflow knowledge, but really how to, to merge those two worlds. And if you, if you don't crack the human component, um, it's going to be very difficult, I think, to, to implement these, these systems you know, syst you know, organization-wide. That's interesting. So people become one of the key elements of solving for the equation. I'll, I'll give you the classic thing, and I'll do this really as fast as possible. We had a customer, 6 million euro tender, and their issue was, do I stay in an SDI hybrid world, or do I make the move to IP? And they knew the move to IP is correct. That's the right move for them. Mm -hmm. if, they invest, if they invest else, if they invest in the old way, they know it's going to be a three or four, five year run at the most. Wrong thing for the company, wrong thing for the capital expenditure. They have to work on the human side, right? And so they aggressively retrained. Makes sense. So Benoit, you're out there doing this every day. What, what advice would you give? Uh, I will give a CTO answer. Uh, <laughs> 
I, I think we, uh, this is what we, at TVS we are doing live production, so you have two options. Either it works, either it doesn't work. Yeah. So we have no options when you do IP, you have to capture the frame. So I, I, I agree with you, we have to take care of the user, you, you, the usability of, IT, of IP. When you have um, an EVS user in front of the LSM, it doesn't care it is IP or SDI, it has to work. So maybe the, the, the CFO wants to, uh, to, uh, to reduce cost, but for, for the user experience, it has to be the same or even better. Mm -hmm. So we try to be pragmatic at EVS. We have this IP for live implementation, and we do piece of implementation sure. with, uh, with Imagine, with Cisco. We, has, we have also at the EBU this small implementation with VRT, and it has to work. And this is why uh, EVS is involved on a technical perspective in uh, all this implementation, and we try to be iterative to wait for the standard to be ready and everything to work together, but we have to go step by step well, and be are, pragmatic. Yeah, those are certainly words that we should all keep in mind. It, it just has to work. Absolutely. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope that you found that to be informative, and we'll see you later.